record. What comes next? Okay. Uh, uh, I didn't expect it. I was like, I didn't expect a new record now by you. And then me uh, neither. Me neither. I, you know, it just opportunity presented itself, and in in you know two weeks it was all done. You know, we had six hours in the studio. It wasn't like one of those days where, yeah, we'll we have all day to get the tune, you know, or we'll do it yeah. in two days. They were kind of like, let's just we got to do it in one day. We got to keep it short, six hours. People just didn't want to be. It's, this was in the middle of June, so people didn't want to be inside for too long. It was just a very everything was like let's do this, but let's. It's not quite the. It's not. It was the nothing, same, right? close, nothing close to back to normal, you know. Yeah. But it was a nice man. It just felt so. I thought about it I was like, well, it's crazy because I haven't been playing. I'm going to be so rusty, you know. <laughs> we, and and we'll have, we won't be able to rehearse, you know. So yeah. I'm going to be documented if they come off at all in a very, you know, there'll be that. Maybe that tentativeness of, of just that you lose when you after you've played a tune, yeah, even five times, you yeah. know, on gigs or something, or just had a thorough rehearsal or whatever. So I'm just like, it's a big risk, you know. But at the same time, it was like it was the temptation just to leave the house with my guitar, just to take yeah. my guitar outside. <laughs> yeah, I can like, imagine. I do it. I look at I look at her every day, most days, and uh, and just say like, you know. So no, we're not going anywhere today. You know, yeah. we used to go everywhere together. You know, <laughs> that's, that's, uh... yeah, it's crazy. So, yeah, no, but like uh, you guys recorded with masks and stuff. Actually, or... we did. We did just oh, because. Wow. I mean, I think once the drummer was uh, Farnsworth was in his booth, I think he took yeah. off his mask. Okay, and sure. Isolated, and same with the bass. Yeah. But me yeah. and Sullivan were in the same room, oh, yeah. about ten feet apart, and he kept his on, so I just kept mine. I just, it's you know, at the time. You know, we were, I don't know, at least the feeling in New York City was like, yeah. we've been through some rough stuff and the least we could do is wear a mask. I mean, that was yeah. happening right away, you know. It's not like other parts of, of America where people are just like, I mean, there's always pockets of people that just say, oh, the government's trying to tell us to take away our yeah. freedom. In New it's, York, we got, hit, here, yeah. we got hit very early and it was very terrible. It was really awful. I mean, yeah. so, yeah, I so everyone just kind of, we're wearing, and we were right in the thick of wearing masks. It didn't seem right to take it off. Yeah, know? sure. And uh, so we just... And, you yeah. did it like that, yeah. But, but you wrote some new tunes also for this one, like Empty Streets well, and all that. Of, and... I had a couple of tunes that I had just written in the time. Yeah. You know, on my little Wurlitzer keyboard that I have, and, and I came up with two two tunes that, you know, and then a couple of tunes that I hadn't recorded that I had yeah. to record on the, the next chance I got. And they all seemed to fit together. You know, the question was just like, I, you know, I felt bad about making guys, you know, play my tunes and record them on the same day. You know, look at them. Yeah, sure. I, know. Them, I hit the music a little bit, but we didn't, we had no chance to play. But then I thought about like, well, if I just, what am I going to do? Go in there and play some tunes, like some standards or some jazz tunes we all know. Like, what would that really document at this yeah. point? Except just be like, so I just like, screw it. I got to go. I got to yeah. go for we had some standbys, you know, and uh, and stuff like that. But I said, at least I'm going to bring the music. Send yeah, it's it beautiful. Yeah. And you can try it. If it doesn't work out, it doesn't work out. But it's a it's quite an optimistic record, also in a way, right? I mean, for me at least, you know, like okay, the title, what comes next? But when I listen to it, it has this joyfulness, at least to my ears. It's, I hope so. We were yeah. happy to play. I was happy to play. I mean, some of the tunes are a little bit somber, and yeah, know, okay, yeah, but. but uh, but yeah, for sure, I wanted to mix it up. You know, I wanted to have some tunes that are at least have a pop. You know, I think you know, like Con Alma is a very positive, you know, yeah. optimistic sounding tune. And then of course the, that Calypso tune that we're yeah, I wanted to ask you about that. that. Yeah, by Billy I... Rollins. Yeah, it's it's a it's a recent tune of his. I don't think he ever he never recorded it because it, it might have been just written. You know, because I was playing in his band for for a while yeah. there, 2010, yeah. 2011. And 2012, I did I did like 30 gigs with them all together. Oh, wow. But there, when yeah. I first went in, I first did like, like, I don't know, four or five gigs as a sub. And then after that, I was kind of in the band. So he we had a rehearsal, like, it was kind of a rehearsal, but it was kind of like an audition for drummers that uh, where he would, because it was a couple of gigs that the drummer couldn't make, so he was going to try mm -hmm. to find a sub. And it was like these four drummers came in and played with, play with us for 40 minutes or so each and i felt for they must have been just like you know it's it's a lot of a lot of pressure 
But he brought that tune in just to see how the guys were doing on a calypso and something. We played, oh. you know, and, and we played it on the gigs a few times. But he brought this music in of this tune, and I just love this melody. Yeah, and it's we, as I said, we played it on gigs a few times, and uh, I just remembered it. And and I he gave me the music. He had this is your copy it was him writ, pet, written. Oh out wow, that's beautiful. So uh, yeah, I I just started playing the song and uh, figured I'd get a chance to record that. You know, yeah. if I could get his permission to do it. So he was cool. Uh, he was, yeah. I got. I. I'm, I don't have his telephone number anymore. I have his his address. I wrote him, but then I asked I really... his nephew Clifton, Clifton yeah. Anderson, Anderson, yeah, to uh, to say, you know, ask ask Sonny if you will you know, give us his blessing <laughs> to record the two. And he said it's cool. He got back to me in a couple of days and said, yeah, oh, wow, beautiful. Fine. So that's you know. Yeah, uh, I, I wanted to ask you since we're speaking about Sonny, like, I mean. Yeah. For me, like, you know, for everyone, he's the genius, of course. Like, well, how, how was it for you to play with him? Like, just... I, may, I mean, just amazing. Every, I mean, I never got over the fact that it was like, you know, holy shit, that's Sonny Rollins over there. Like, it was like seeing like a character from history, you know, like for me, yeah, it's I know, like, yeah. you know, oh, there's Gandhi, you know, there's, you know, <laughs> somebody like that, you know, wow, it's, uh, you know. I don't know. He's, he was just a larger than life figure, you know, and uh, it was it was amazing to be around him and and, and you know just get yeah. sometimes the sound checks were like a lot more fun that he would just go into different standards on the sound check and uh, just being around Bob Cranshaw was great yeah, too. I, loved, yeah. you know, I hung with Bob more than because Sonny would kind of he would go and be in by himself. He didn't really he was already having problems with his hips, so he wasn't yeah. really walking around like. He used to be a really active person, you know, doing athletic yeah. stuff. But he was getting, I mean, I, I met him right before he turned 80. And cool. then uh, I was with him for those couple of years. And he was, his hips were, were bothering him. And But I just think he was of that, you know, he's of that generation that we weren't going to complain. You yeah. know, <laughs> sure. he, he was just kind of, you know. And there were some nights that were where he was frustrated with, with the band and with himself. You know, I saw this kind of thing everyone says about Sonny, how he's so hard on people and hard on, on himself mostly. Yeah. And I, I saw that in a few times and he was never really totally ever happy. But oh, well. <laughs> with the with the the gigs, I don't think. But I don't think he ever has been. Yeah. And uh but there were some moments when it was cool. To me it was just a a lesson of just like just like you have to Okay, you have the respect and the reverence of this person, but to play with them, you can't be polite. You know, otherwise they're not going to get a sense of of what you can contribute to the conversation. So, after a while, he was just like, you know, I mean, I just and through his the only thing he ever said to me, he didn't get come down on me at all. He just was like, "Don't be afraid to step on my toes. Just come out oh, there. Wow. And don't be afraid to like." I don't want you just to comp. I want to. He wanted to have a conversation. And a lot of times when I would start to solo, he would keep playing, and I would be confused, like, "Oh, he's still. I've yeah. already stepped up <laughs> soloing." Sure. But he just wanted to accompany me, you know, or yeah. just keep the conversation. So one time, I remember once we played this this festival. I think it's in. I think it was Vienne in France, and there's uh, we we did like this ballad we had played. Been playing a kind of an obscure ballad. I think it was mm -hmm. called "Our Very Own." Or it was kind of a little bit like "Embraceable You," but it had some other little moves. Yeah. But this ballad, and we just played, and you know, he would play one chorus, and then kind of with his body language. And Bob Crenshaw said, "When he backs away, it's your solo." You know, like that's what you know. Okay, oh, okay. He gave me the sign to start playing, but then he never really stopped playing. But I didn't stop playing either. So we basically just played together for two choruses yeah. and at the, end of the gig Sonny was like that's that's what I'm talking about that's oh. what I'm... so so the whole lesson was like as much as you respect and revere someone and just feel like they're just telling you yeah just come on mix yeah. it up with me and you're like mix it up with you you're like <laughs> the oracle and I'm not when the oracle <laughs> you're gonna listen you know I'm gonna be playing very like how I feel which is respectful yeah. to be in this presence but he said no you gotta you gotta you gotta play more don't even worry about he says, you can't step on my toes don't worry about it and i realize yeah. he's right because he's so strong you know what yeah. i mean it's you know yeah. it's just so that was the biggest lesson and uh, of just someone that you know i had so much respect for like but that's the thing don't be afraid of anybody and and
and since that time, I really have felt different, like about playing with people in general. Not in a way of like I played with Sonny Rollins, so I'm not afraid of you. <laughs> yeah, no, but, no, no. but but more of the the positive side of that, which is like I'm not afraid of anybody. I I could be in situations where I have no idea what's going on musically, and the guys are playing stuff over my head and this and that. Okay, that's just you're like I don't understand what's being said. Yeah. So you have that you can have that kind of reaction to it, which is natural. But after Sonny, there's really no reason to be afraid of anybody. Yeah. There's that's... really no reason to be intimidated because. Hey, if you if you're in there and you know the song and you know what's happening musically and you have a idea about how to go and make choices, then do it and don't yeah. second guess your choices and don't uh, because you're you're around someone who's so strong that it just makes you realize, wow, I really don't, I'm not as convinced about my own stuff. Yeah, you know, so yeah. You realize that the lesson is to be convinced, yeah. convince yourself, and if you're not convinced, don't let on. Just still play it like you're. Like you're yeah. with, uh, with with what you're playing, and that's what it is, making choices and having the the courage of your convictions, you know. Yeah. Because that's what's like Sonny, that's what Sunny's you know, all about, courage. I mean, yeah, audacity. Definitely. Like we would play stuff, and a lot of the tunes were very much in one key center. You know, the calypsos, of course, just yeah. one, four, five, and some six, whatever. Very simple harmonic structures in terms of one tonality, but Sunny would be playing in every key, and and with such, like you know just complete i mean that's the word audacity like yeah, i just yeah. I can't believe he played that i just can't believe he thought of something so out in a way but at the same time everything that was out came from came from the melody came from yeah, the yeah. from the basic song and simple songs like so he was just an incredible lesson in just like taking something simple and this is this is the game for him yeah. like make as many variations and uh, you know, but but just to watch him play too, even though he was physically hurting, his the rhythm was all in his. To be on the stage with him, yeah. Physical, it, the the rhythm of what he was playing was in his physical, in his body. He yeah. felt the rhythms he was playing. He was moving to the rhythms. It wasn't just a phrase on the end of one. It was like, yeah, that. or yeah. the way he the way his body would be connected with what he was playing was like, oh yeah, that's. It's not just a machine we're operating here that we're pushing buttons on. It's like to fully get it to do what you want, you know, you put your entire being yeah. and your whole body into it. That's so, incredible. Yeah. That's, oh, that's, yeah. And, I mean, I've read you play with Sonny and I was like, I have to ask you that because, you know, like one of my favorite records, like since being a guitarist, is like The Bridge, you know, with Jim. Me too. Me and, too. And it's like, I, I, did you ever think about that record when you, let's say the first gig you played with him that that you were like, fuck, time, this is all the time. I mean, played, you know, it or... except for, I mean, Cranshaw was there. So I would think about that being like, wow, those two guys were there too in 1962, you know, like, wow, that's pretty yeah. deep. <laughs> oh, exa yeah, exactly. But, uh, but the music didn't sound like that. Yeah. You know, and, and that's for sure. And in terms of the sound of it, you know what I mean? Because we were playing big, it was more, it was also an adapt, uh, uh, making an adaption, uh, adaptation for me to, uh, playing big stages and playing yeah. music that has some subtlety to it, but at the same time, it's it's a rock concert. You know, like we're we're playing and this the, the electric bass for the most time, and then he played this kind of like a a stick bass, but it was yeah. the volume level, the volume of the drums, the volume of we had a conga player that was like another kind of would take out a certain dimension of the yeah. of the of the sonic world was like there the, the percussion. So I was like. I felt definitely like it was a wall of sound that I had to, that I had to, you know. But did you play loud? It, like, did you crank up your amp or not really? Or I, mean, I tried to not play that loud, but it was definitely at the louder yeah. oh, place. And it was just also like, like where we were, the setting. We, you yeah. know, we had to play loud. We were playing in sometimes open places or yeah, big. Yeah, VN, yeah, it's like. You know, yeah. the end. that was huge. And we played in, you know, like a smaller venue was like, we played in, um, what's the famous festival? Uh, not Montreux, but the other one. Antibes. Antibes, yeah, Antibes. Oh, yeah, yeah, jazz at Antibes, yeah. Really kind of a small space. You play Antibes and it's like, it's not this huge expanse of people going back and back and back. <laughs> we played in, we played in Monterey Festival in that big stadium. Wow. You know, the big That's one. Right. I had played there once before with Diana Crawl in the big. It's like eight thousand people can sit in this area. But but Antibes is like it doesn't 
the chairs didn't go that far back. It was kind yeah. of like a informal lawn concert, you know, people yeah. set up. <laughs> oh, that's cool. So it was pretty small. So we, when we were in smaller areas, it, it felt, you know, a little more intimate. Yeah. But uh, but he played louder. He had his mic, you know, right on the yeah. saxophone. So it was just like, it, it was loud. It was loud for me, you know. Incredible. So, yeah, uh, yeah, that, that's yeah, why I'm asking. Yeah. Adapting to that. Plus, because, you know, you think about the bridge, that was what got us onto this topic, was like yeah. the intimacy of the, of, yeah. you know, it doesn't sound like Jim is playing that loud. You know, it's just kind of like, there's just this beautiful, and you see the band like on that, TV show, the Ralph Gleason show. You've seen that clip yeah, where they yeah, yeah, play yeah, a couple yeah. of tunes. And it's like you can just tell they're just like close to each other and listening to each other. Yeah. And they're just blending. No, you know, no amp on the bass, probably, you know, just like. So that it was a different setup sonically. You yeah. Know? And Sonny was aware. I think he was aware of that. He was playing in a big space and he was going to communicate to lots yeah. of people. So as much as the music had this intimacy, there was still the feeling of like, you know, yeah, be yeah. big. Be big, yeah. big. And, I, and I never really, you know, I don't think I ever really. Still, I mean, I, I just had some chances to get used to that with some groups, you know, with yeah, Crawl and, yeah. and 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 Joshua Redman playing Redman, some yeah. bigger, bigger theaters sometimes, bigger places. But I still, you know, I just I go like this no matter where. If I'm playing for ten people or ten thousand, like I just I'm kind of here. I'm trying to look up and be around with other musicians, but yeah. I enjoy, believe me, I enjoy playing for people. And if there's a lot of people. No, no, I know, I, I know exactly feel, what you mean. Yeah. You can feel an energy, but I'm not like, you know, I don't yeah. have a sense of like, okay, I'm Sammy Davis Jr. You know, I'm not, I'm not, I can't <laughs> entertain that way. So, but to see Sonny do that and really be, I mean, just without, tr you know, without trying, he just had charisma, you know, but he yeah. was putting it out there, man. He was definitely not, there's nothing introverted about his playing, mm -hmm. you know? Uh, so that was a great. The deepest thing was that one of, at this, uh, I think it was the same time when he brought that tune out, uh, and the different drummers were. We could have been playing this tune. We we're playing some calypso, and it just wasn't feeling good. And Sonny was not happy, you know. And I felt bad, like the guys just like came yeah. out, and so Sonny was trying to tell him things to, you know, make it make him what what he wanted from him and stuff. And it wasn't happening. Finally, it started to get a little better. He changed the tempo or something happened and it just started to groove and Sonny stopped and was like, yeah, that's grooving. It feels good. That's what I'm talking about. This is, yeah. this is and the guy was so happy. The drummer true. was so happy. And in his effort to, you know, really please Sonny, he said, uh, so Mr. Rollins, on this kind of calypso, would the snare drum be open or closed? Like, it's a technical question. Like, what's yeah. the sound? Yeah. You want to, you know, it's a valid question for a drummer to want to know what to do. Like, if you're doing this beat, you know, play the snare. And it was a valid question, but Sonny, like, he was quiet for, like, 20 seconds, which is a long time, because the vibe had just started to get good, and the vibe had been <laughs> oh, bad for a long time. So he sat there for 20 seconds, you know, and it's a long time. And I was like, oh, shit. And, and then he said, then he said, uh, he said, you know, that's up to you. He okay. said, this, this whole thing is about making choices. And if you're playing for the music, and, and, you're 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 in the music. This is I'm paraphrasing, but yeah, this is yeah, sure. what he said. He, he basically said, "You're here to make decisions, you know." And if you think about it, you couldn't be in a more privileged position. Yeah, that's. He yeah. went on to say something like, sure. "You know, there's symphony orchestras all around the world, thousands of great musicians who can play their instruments great. They have to follow a conductor and play what's put before them. We're improvising. We decide. Oh yeah. To play. Uh, it's like you, you're privileged." You know, you have this freedom, you know, but the, but the lesson was with the free, but you have to play for the music first. If you just take the freedom and say, it's all about my freedom, then you're betraying that freedom yeah. by being irresponsible. But if you're so uh, concerned about being correct, then you're not taking advantage of the freedom that you're given. You're living yeah. like a robot and you don't need to be a robot. No one's asking you to be a robot. Make decisions make the right decisions because you believe it's right. You're in the music enough to know yeah. that the music will tell you what to do. Once you trust, like I was saying about yeah, trust, yeah, yeah, have the yeah. courage of your convictions. Once you trust your, your instincts, then the whole thing is about making decisions and, and you know, yeah. stick with it, you know? So the point is like, I don't care what, I don't just have to be traditional Calypso snare drum sound. The point is like, get the feel and play for the music and 
that's the le- and so that was like that kind of changed my whole because I've been you know playing for a long time already. Yeah. It's 2011. I've got a chance to make records and be in a lot of play with a lot of people. And I always I never thought of it exactly in those terms. I never thought of it as like, wow, improvising is a is a privilege. If you just yeah. think about how many people that's amazing actually yeah. don't get to improvise that. So it changed my whole uh, perspective of what I was doing. I mean, I always even before I had great teachers, people like you know, like Jim Hall and teachers yeah. from the Packers that, that, that tell us all, you know, yeah, improvise, but make sense, you know, make yeah. a story. It, don't just play your licks. You know, the greatest solos have that, have that narrative feeling of like, here's this solo. It's this story. Yeah. It could be like other stories in a certain way and the vocabulary and the language and the yeah. attitude, but it's not, it's this story. And the person who, who made it, you know, improvised it, but they have this, yeah, you know, background of language and vocabulary but they're still able to make it feel spontaneous and the decisions that they make so so that's the game is not just to like run your stuff but to improvise and make a little song you know yeah. but to hear it it put in the yeah. perspective of like that's the privilege that you get to do that instead of just find a nice story and recite it over and over yeah again. yeah yeah that's that's true actually you know? Yeah, amazing. If, if I got nothing else out of that, if I was only there just that one day of getting to rehearse, if just called in out of, if, if, if I got nothing else out of being around him for, you know, a year and a half off and on, uh, that would have been enough because that yeah. was just, oh, sh- yeah, that's right. That's right. So because of you get this privilege and you have this freedom to play what you want, that's even more of a, of a call to you, uh, a, a, kind of a challenge to be versed yeah. in the topics that you're yeah. talking about like yeah, learn yeah. The tunes learn the music go deeper into the music get less about the shit you want to put on top of it and deeper into knowing the, con- the, music. the, the content in a way more yeah. content yeah. knowing the music so you play for the music knowing the song so you play for the song play from the song you know yeah. so, wow improvising is heavy that freedom that power comes with a great responsibility. You know, it's just like yeah. Spider-Man. You know, with great power comes great responsibility. Yeah. And that's what improvisers have to do. Instead of feeling like, I better have some slick shit to play when people are listening to me. You know, yeah. like, yeah, I exactly. want no. that. You gotta balance the two. That's the whole thing. Anyway. Yeah. But but for, for me, like, you mentioned now, like, this storytelling with solos, right? Right? For me, or like... It's a cliche, but it's... it's, it's, it's no, it's not. It's not. But for, for me, it's like... I mean, like, I don't know, this solo, like, pantomime, I don't know if you see it, right? I, I teach this solo, this is by you, this on Joshua Redman's Freedom in the Groove. I wow. teach, this solo is for me, like, true composed, it's improvised, of course, but the stuff wow. you play, man, like, it's, I, what, you'd be so nice to come home to, but Jim Hall and this one, for me, are, like, two oh, solos wow. that I always give to every student, but uh, be, be, besides other solos by you, but... You you yeah. seem to like, I don't know, have to know you know where to go in a way how to use the intervals how to, and it's always not overplaying. How, how did you learn that? Right. I mean, well, I'm I'm I don't know. I mean, that's a long time ago. I don't remember what my thought process was. You know, playing but that I, tune. Yeah, not not just on that one, but like in but, general. But I mean, in know. general, just like I'm trying to look at what the tune is giving me to work to work with. Like that yeah. wasn't uh, one thing I was you know kind of about with the approach to improvisation before I got to play with Sonny even before I got to play with some of my other heroes you know and got to really have yeah. a lot of experience playing one thing I always thought about improvisation was that the definition of it is use what you have to do make the best of the situation right yeah. so that away from music that's the definition of improvisation of improvising like oh damn I lost my keys, so how am I going to get into my house? You know, let's see. Let's improvise now. There's a ladder. So, you know, you have to improvise with what you, you know, yeah, have yeah. to work with. And that, you know, early on, I translated that into it's the song. Learn the song. Use the song yeah. to, to to make you play something that's unique to that song. Now, of course, then you run the risk of getting, here's the solo I play on that song. It's from the melody, but I got to get stuck in my little, you have to, not get stuck because yeah, then you're also somewhere. But the point is to, as much as you can, think about improvisation as using what you have to work with and and looking at the song, not just the chord changes, yeah. 
you know, but looking at the melodic content, the intervals, the feeling of the song, you know, all those things, because there's no definition of improvisation in a dictionary where it says, exactly. uh, you know, like improvisation, like the, the fourth definition will be where you apply scales and arpeggios to chords. No, there's no definition. Of, it's yeah, not, yeah, exactly. we made that, you know, some, some, some guy at some institution said, this is how we improvise. We know the scales of the, you know, so it's just getting deeper into if there's one thing about a tune you can kind of play with, play with that. It'll make yeah. everything you say somewhat on topic as yeah. opposed to running the risk of saying something clever, but it's a non sequitur in, in, in the, yeah. for the song. So that's, that's always been my approach to songs that, you know, and, and people's original tunes, I you know, it's the same approach to just to try to look at what is there and yeah. make something from it, you know. Yeah, know. you you always make sense out of it. I mean, like every time I listen, it's just like, damn, it's you know, it sounds so simple, but then, yeah, in a way, it's not. That's kind of like a rock ballad, right? Pantomime is kind of like a rock. Pantomime, ballad. it's just like da 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 da, bam bam. That's your solo. Oh, oh. I don't know, if it, but the tune was like kind of like a rock ballad, right? Yeah, it's like, like yeah, it's like yeah, it's like yeah, it's like a da da da. Right. Da, da, da. And then you come with this solo. And I, I remember I, I was starting kind of with jazz. That was 1997. Wow. And I bought that CD. And I, I was just like, damn, man, that's the best guitar playing, you know, ever. That's like, crazy, seriously, man. man. I, yeah. It's that's funny that, yeah, I felt I didn't even have my uh, my my guitar then on that record really? when I was with Josh's band. I got it after. I got it in 98. I really the guitar I'm playing. So I was playing this L5 at that time and trying to get used to this big, bigger guitar. And it was <laughs> oh, kind yeah. of a monster, that guitar. I, I had my 175 before that. I made a few records on the 175. And uh, then I got this L5 because it was definitely a step up. It was, you know, more sustained. Yeah. But it was like a beast of a guitar. The, 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 the neck It's more chunky, was, yeah. The neck angle was high and it was just like tension. It was like hard to play. Yeah. So I remember just struggling a lot and then... You know, playing with Josh, it was like such a, you know, so fluent and everything. I just always felt playing in that band like I'm just stuck in the mud. What's going on? Like I couldn't Seriously? get I couldn't get flowing, you know. But so and, and part of it, like a couple of years later when I got this guitar, there was still a, a big learning curve with this guitar because it was like the most harmonics I'd ever had to control before. It was like piano players talk about like, you know, practicing on their little upright or something like that. Then getting on a gig where there's like a 12 foot Steinway. Yeah. And then it's like, oh my God, I'm, I can't control this much sound. So I felt that with this guitar, like this is a lot of sound to control. So I, all the things that were sloppy about my technique and all these things came in, you know, was like a, one of those mirrors where Kinda, you see okay. all the lines in your face. Like, oh, that's what I look like. You know, not a fuzzy, you know, flattering light, soft light. It was like, oh. So I had to, so when I got this guitar, I definitely was a few years and I'm still working on it, but I'm just getting to like feeling like this is how you can, you know, oh, well, make a sound. Oh. And also as you get older, you learn to play, you learn to extend your technique at the same time you learn to play within your limitations. Like, I think that's a big thing too. It's just like, and I see this in students. It's like, yeah, you got something that you do. That's cool. Work that. You yeah. know, like that's, you know, expand it, stretch, learn how to reach, learn how to learn more stuff. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, a smart guy and a smart person who's going to actually, who's playing with the idea that I want people to enjoy my playing. I want people mm -hmm. to play stuff that sounds good, learns to play what feels good to play. Because yeah. when it feels good to play, that's it'll so sound important. like it feels good and sound good. So I think a lot of people are just like, they run them guitar players run themselves into a corner trying to shred yeah if, unless they're unless they really hear that you know trying to play like bird if unless they really hear it you know it's like you got to build use the blocks that you have you have to yeah. use those things use your crappy set of crayons and make something beautiful you know what i mean it doesn't have to be a great a, you know every you know every color yeah you know, no it's you know, yeah, what you got and and you could do it. It's all touch, you know. So, but but getting a good instrument was definitely, you know, you have to play up to yeah. its level, you know. So that that helped. But on those days, like I remember just feeling, oh, feeling struggling with that instrument, and also it was a new thing of just like playing in a band that was starting to tour, you know. Yeah. Play. 
a lot and you hear yourself play a lot with the you know the same cats the same tunes and it's like wow this is deep you know the cons- to have consistency and to like and just to keep it but together th- on the th- road that was a just- burning band right we had some fun it was my first you know real touring experience like the festivals a and month stuff tour and, festivals yeah. a month yeah. tour not all festivals a lot of yeah. little smaller gigs but n- not really small places nice he had josh had nice gigs is 1996 Seven. 95 yes. 96 six, oh, yeah. 96 96 96 six. and seven yeah into like this like into the summer of 97 so it wasn't really that long of a time but we yeah we had a few we had a few bus tours we were like in Europe oh, wow. and the States, on the bus, you know, you have a hotel when you got off the bus in the morning to chill out and everything. Then after the gig, sometimes you get on the bus and sleep on the bus. Yeah. That was, that's oh, cool. It's a great amazing. way of not wasting time in the day traveling. So I got to see places and it was yeah, great. That you know, was a great, you know, I was, I would enjoy it and appreciate it and take it for granted even less. Now, I mean, I was taking it for granted then, but. I just was trying to trying to hang and trying to learn the music and trying to because they were already a band when I got they yeah. had already played a bit and and did a live record at the Vanguard and uh, they were already a oh yeah exactly. I was I was added to that you know and yeah. I felt like Josh wanted the guitar to really contemporize the music in a way to make it more uh, you know it's less, it, of, a, less it, of a jazz quintet sound more, and, and, it gets more groovy I think yeah. Yeah, he was writing songs to that, but I think as sound wise, I don't think I really did what he wanted me to do in a way. Because in a way, I was the most straight ahead of anybody in the band. Like, like I just wanted to play some groove, groove tunes and yeah. play blues and stuff like that, which they did, of course. But I, I don't think I added the you know the element of like How interesting to see it like that. Well, I mean, I don't know. I could be wrong. Josh never told yeah. me that he I let him down or anything like that. I just like looking back on it. Thinking, knowing Josh and knowing what maybe he was looking for. Oh, wow. I don't know. I don't think, I mean, yeah, I no, no, it's, it's interesting. It wasn't to that I, yeah, yeah, because I just think he was trying to make the music less about a jazz quintet. If he wanted that, he could have got a trumpet player and they would have been, you know, like he wanted the guitar to take it into more, you know, yeah. contemporary grooves. And maybe I, I wasn't, I just, I was trying to play straight ahead. You know? Interesting. I, I don't know. For me, on that record, like that. It's like well, that's his writing. His writing is the sound of that of that record, and you know. Yeah, but you're playing, man. It's like, it's just everything. Everything. It's like, you know, when I speak to students about some of of your solos, like especially in that album, it's like it's yeah, true right. composed. You know, it sounds like, oh. damn. It's like on the spot. Every everything you do, it's not showing off. It's just like, like you said, yeah. it serves the tune, and you know, it's just yeah. That that's why I mean, you contributed so much to that. At least in my yeah. my ear. Yeah. Okay. Uh, cool. Thank you. But uh, I just wanted to ask you, Peter, one more thing about your first records, the, the, where you hooked up with Brad, Brad and Christian and Hutch. Yeah. Uh, yeah. How did that quartet, Signs of Life, you know, that's for me also one of my yeah. I mean, favorite I, albums. Like, how did that yeah. begin? That was that was my 175. That was my still my first guitar. Uh, you still have it? I. I do have that guitar. Oh, wow. Yeah, I don't have the L5 anymore. I sold oh. that. But um, well, that was just I've been playing a bit with Brad with uh, with uh, Jimmy Cobb, and we played a lot with different groups, different rhythm sections. But my first record was with Brad and and Weber, John yeah. Weber and John Jimmy Weber, yeah, Jimmy Cobb. And then for the next one, I just wanted to get. I liked the sound of the quartet, and I had a bunch of new tunes I wanted to play. But I just wanted to get, you know, just to, I just thought, I think I remember hearing McBride and Hutch play together one time. I was like, wow, that's a great rhythm section. And, you know, I knew those guys. I'd known Greg for a while and, and knew, knew Christian too a little bit. And just said, like, tried to put, you know, I had another chance to do another record. So we weren't a working band at all. We did one rehearsal and oh, then we did the record really? date the next day. No, that was, we never did oh. a gig. Oh, we wow. never did a gig. Seriously? No. Nope. Uh, what about. The return then, like the Science of Life. Well, that was what? three nights. That was the only time we ever played a gig. That was three nights at Dizzy's. Oh, and they recorded wow. the last two nights, and uh, and yeah, the record that came out wasn't really supposed to be a record. Oh. Was just the last night. 
I, that we, we put out as a record. You know, yeah, because you're burning, out. like you're like the uh, blues for Bulgaria and all those tunes, you know, they're like 70 well, we, minutes and it's just like... Oh. It's, that's why I didn't ever think it should be a record. But oh, they really? can, you know, they kind of said, well, let's just do it and we're just going to put out that night, like as if you're, you know, and they made it a two CD. Yeah, they were talking right. about making it like a three CD set. I'm like, no. No way. Three CD, it's crazy. You know, but they said if we just put out two CDs, it's basically both sets with one tune that we had to that they had to cut off or something. Yeah. But uh so I was like, okay. And and I, I mean, because they were just gonna choose the second night, I never even really listened to the takes or anything. I'm just like, well, okay, I guess that was the better night. It felt like a better night. And oh. uh but I'm like, how long are the tunes? You know, everybody was stretching out and everything, and it weren't. I knew they were recording it, but that's just because Dizzy's records records the gigs, and uh, and they like the tunes are long. But you know, it, it, that was what happened. That was the gig. I'm like, okay, yeah. well, and I kind of was like, well, it's it's a nice story to have to be able to get together 20 years later again, and then yeah, no, so it's the great great life funny, presentation. It was, of... it, yeah, well. Ah. I don't like the way it was recorded. For sure. I mean, I don't like okay. the sound of it. Like it, to me, the guitar sound is, is atrocious. But uh, I, I remember feeling like it was kind of a lot of pressure, you know, just like playing at Dizzy's with those cats. And I just would have, you know, it, it was fun. I was like really, you know, thrilled that we were able to put it together. Yeah. But it wasn't necessarily supposed to be a recording. It was kind of like an option. And I was like, well, you know, yeah. he would go into a studio and make and play the new tunes instead of just the old tunes again. But they 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 like it's great. You should we listen to it a lot. We like it, and we'll put it out. The guys are happy, and it could be a double CD. And I'm like, okay. But I had it was actually done. I think we did it. Was it before or after the other session when I did with Gerald and Bill Stewart? We had some yeah. of the same tunes. I think it was before that actually. It was the first time I really played those tunes. So the session with Gerald came after, and then they decided to put that one out. Anyway. Yeah, uh, those guys are. I mean, McBride yeah, is yeah. a force of nature. Greg is, you know, just an amazing drummer. All these guys, and yeah. and uh, it was just nice that, you know, twenty years had just flown by, and that we get able to just get together and, and do it again. So, yeah, it, it would be fun, nice to see this fun three days. It was definitely live on road. Three. Exactly. Yeah. That was a fun, a fun three days of playing. I just, you know. Yeah. Now it sounds amazing. Like the the one other thing I'm really curious about is like. I listened a lot years ago to that your solo guitar record, Life at Smalls. Oh yeah. Which is another, uh, which is a, like a totally different animal, like a creature. Sure. And I wanted also, to ask you. Also, wasn't supposed to be a recording. But, I really. Uh, <laughs> wow. Well, okay. Yeah. I don't know. It captures your solo playing so nice. I just wanted to ask you, how do you approach? I mean, I did last year before yeah. lockdown also some solo guitar concerts, and I was initially scared. Like I'm re still now. I, I'm. You know, you're I was totally scared. Stage. I still am scared when I play solo. I, I still am. It's like, uh, I don't know. I did I did it just because, I mean, it wasn't intended to, re to record it, but I started playing at Smalls solo just because I had noticed that they were having these early sets at Smalls yeah. at around like 6 to 7.30 or something like that of solo piano, and then the band would come on at 8. So I was like, Spike, how come you never have a solo guitar? He's like, I don't know. No one ever asked me. You want to, you want to do it? <laughs> So I was like, now that I kind of already said, I was just kind of giving him a hard time. Like, how come you only have piano players? I can never have. I wasn't even thinking like to ask him for it. He's like, why don't you do it? I'm like, well, oh, all right, I'll try it. You know, and I just figured, you know, there's nobody there. You know, at, at six o'clock, whatever. So, and I just, it was the thing that I was always most afraid of. You know, even just doing an intro would terrify me. Like someone would say, like, give me a guitar intro or something like that. And I'd be just me, you know, like, what do I do? Like this, the whole idea of like playing by myself always made me uncomfortable. And so I just figured like, well, if I can just face the monster, oh. you know, yeah. uh, Oh, something says try again. Hmm. Okay. We're good. Well, That's something's nice. cancel. Cancel. Okay. So it was popping up on my screen there. Uh -huh. Um, I figured if I could get through a set, you know, or two sets in this case, I could get through an intro. You know, I wouldn't yeah. be I wouldn't be so scared when someone asked me to play. And I had a couple of tunes that I kind of worked on. I remember on one of my recordings, I did Blood Count, and I had a little solo arrangement of just the melody. I didn't really yeah. improvise on it. I just played the melody of the tune. 
And uh, I was like, let me just get together a couple of little arrangements or semi-arrangements because I realized like I could never just remember that much. Like I would remember some element of how to present the song, yeah. but then, you know, the second chorus would be like, well, what do I do now? You know, how do I just play by myself? So that was the main challenge was to try to use those little arrangements as launching launching points to, to just play, keep the tune short, but yeah. expound, don't just play the arrangement, you know? And I didn't think my arrangements were that. I really was kind of like, when I practice it sometimes, like, well, when I'm playing solo, you can just do things and try, you know, try different substitutions without worrying yeah. about there being any any piano, conflict piano. or anything. Yeah. So yeah. the idea of, of just like, uh, and also how to blow by myself, how to improvise and play things that didn't sound just like they're floating in, in the atmosphere, nowhere, you know, yeah. so that was the thing. So how to comp for myself and how to like, just, just That's fill it out it. in my own way. I definitely wasn't going to try to, you know, do the Joe pass thing or, yeah. any, or the, you know, I don't have any finger style chops at all. It's all with the pick. So I was just, I'm just like, yeah, well, it's beautiful. What you do, do it. Like... Let me just try to do it. And a lot of it is, you know, I don't know. I don't. I the, never, the monk tunes are amazing, and Giant Steps. It's like uh, really cool. Yeah, all that well, stuff. it's so cool. I remember playing Giant Steps a lot with Dr. Lonnie Smith, and he would do that thing where he would just kind of take the tune by himself and just like melt cool. it down into just this. It got super abstract, but he would leave me out there sometimes on that tune, and I would sometimes practice it. Like, well, what do I do when Dr. Lonnie leaves me out there? Because he would stop the time. He would yeah. when he did it. He would stop the time. So I say, well, maybe I can do that, and learn to kind of. That was a bit, a, a bit of, a lot of it too was playing solo, was just learning how to play rubato and how to control the flow of going from rubato into time. Like yeah. if I believe it, then maybe I can make people listening believe it. So I yeah. have to really think about forward motion, but not always just trying to lock in with the drummer, you know? Yeah. Because there's no drummer. It's like you have to lock in with myself. And But a lot of rubato is like, man, a, rubato is deep. It doesn't always have to be super slow. It's just about controlling the flow. And I would listen to great singers and great accompanists play not in a steady pulse, like, oh, that's really beautiful. Someone's, yeah. depending on what's happening in the music, the harmony follows the melody or the melody follows the harmony. There's this, yeah. you know, like a tennis match, the ball just keeps going over the net, you know, so to get that volleying thing. And yeah, I think I think you succeeded, man. I like, the, I love yeah. it because it's, it, it's, it's, pretty it's, it's like, well, no, but it's like you said, it's it's still swinging, you know. Uh -huh. It's like I, I, when you play the single lines, I, I hear the drums yeah. actually, you know, it's like, it's like, I would hope yeah. so, yeah. Well, I'm, I don't know. It's, I'm it's still just, working on that more than ever now when we have so much time to play. Yeah. To play I always ask guitarists, well, you know, about solo concerts because for me, yeah. it's it's such a, you know, I'm always so like, ah, oh, solo. Oh, concert. it's awful. I mean, I you know? every time I play solo, I'm always, there's always a point of it where I think like, damn, this was a really bad idea, you know? <laughs> yeah, I'm Like, I should have just called a bass player. Or, you know, and, and a lot of times when I play it small, when I first started, they had this thing where there was a clock on the wall, like, right, yeah. for whatever reason. And I would look at it thinking, like, okay, I got a 60-minute set I'm going to do. And I would look at it, like, you know, after, like, a couple tunes, struggling and feeling like, oh, man, this is a bad idea. I would just happen to catch the clock out of my eye and I'm like, you know, six minutes had gone by. I'm like, oh my God, 54 more minutes of what am I, how am I going to, you know, but oh every time God. I did it, usually the second sets were always better because I would just <laughs> calm down and get Breathe. get into it and say, you know, what the hell and go for it, the second set more. But there's, it would always be like four bars where I'm like, I got to try this again. I got to, <laughs> you know, like four bars were like, yeah, you can, if you, if you could do it for four bars where it doesn't feel like a completely idiotic, you know, needlessly egocentric thing to do. If I can do it for four bars, why can't I do it for like a whole tune? Why yeah, can't a whole tune sense. be good? Why can't a whole set be good? Like you just want to think like it's all concentration. You just have yeah. to get better at focusing on what you're supposed to be doing at that moment and play yeah. for the music instead of freaking out that there's that you're up there by yourself, which yeah. is always a good part of it. You know, makes sense. So, yeah. Anyway. Uh Peter, can I just ask you some more some other questions? Of course, your... yeah. How are you cool. doing on time? I'm looking at the time now. It's oh one thirty. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Let me know when you're. Uh, I, no, just... I got about fifteen. Then I got to run to pick up my okay my son from from. I just wanted to ask you about five. two collaborations, like uh, sure, 
how was it to play with you with Lee Connets on Parallels? I mean, like, uh, again, how, how deep is the ocean, the compic there on that album? For me, oh. it's like... Man, you know, Lee Konitz was someone I met when I was still in high school because he lived in the building where I grew up in. My my parents had a part. I went to like probably like let's see, eighth grade through you know my my parents didn't move out of that place until many years later. So I met Lee Konitz and I was like in ninth grade, just getting in tenth grade, getting into jazz. And then there was another lady in the building who was a family friend a little bit, and she was, knew I was getting into jazz. And she's like, oh, you're into jazz? Do you know Lee Conant? So he lives on the eighth floor. You know, like, he was this, like, mm -hmm. like, oh, yeah, I've read about him in my, you know, but I had no idea that he was in the building. So I, I figured out who he was, and then one time I, I met him because I was coming up in the elevator. I had just come from the Lincoln Center Library, and I took out a bunch of records that I would do. I'd listen to records and record them on a cassette. But I had a Lee Conant's record, in my in my arm that I got from the library, the elevator stopped on eight. I, we lived oh, yeah. on the twelfth floor, and the elevator stopped on eight, and it was Lee. And he looked and said, "Hey, that's my record." And that's how I got to intro. I guess how it's like, yes, wow. Mr. Conitz, I'm uh, you know I, I'm Peter. I live. You know, this lady told me about that you were in the building, and I've been looking forward to trying. To, I mean, I was super shy, but <laughs> and then it turned out he was a uh, he was a friend of Attila Zoller, and yeah. I got to I got wow. to study with Attila Zoller, Seriously, not through Lee, but through someone else. And then they were friends. So we just oh, got wow. to know Lee as like, he was like the first, you know, famous jazz musician I'd ever got to meet up close, you know? So, uh, he was like, uh, you know, someone from my, from my youth. And, uh, yeah. I would see him every, every time we played, he was super nice about, you know, having me come up to play. I took a lesson with him and then he was like, I ah, just come play some tunes. Like he wanted to blow and have someone, to, you know, <laughs> to come, yeah. sad comping for him. But we tried some lines together, you know, like the little play some heads together. And he was super nice and like just uh -huh. up up for jamming and got got me on a few gigs, uh, you know, around the early 90s. And then this record date came up for Chesky, which was kind of strange because you know how they are yeah. like super. Uh, for the recording, yeah. Yeah, they have this one microphone that everybody has to set up around. Yeah. You know, and uh, they're super audiophile crazy guys. and. It was cool. It was fun that we played in this church, which sounded very weird. You know, the room we were on the the stage of this church, but it was cool. And Mark Turner was there, and, yeah, and Mark know, and yeah. Lee had a really. It was nice for them to kind of it's play. Beautiful. Mark was, you know, Palo Alto. Kind of, you guys did like it sounds amazing. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's like, as, you know, yeah. it was fun, and I, you know, I remember just seeing Lee over the years, and always just having that. Yeah, you know, it was funny because like when I was about twenty, early twenties, twenty two, twenty three. I started playing with Lou Donaldson. Yeah, I know. And, I wanted to and, ask you about that. But and, and that was kind of like he, him and Lee were kind of like the two polar opposites <laughs> of like the same generation. You know, both came, were like after Bird, you know, like, so, but, but they were both like, so Lee always had this thing, like, oh, you play with Lou Donaldson, you do, you do, you play that kind of stuff, you know, like it was a little bit of that, <laughs> that you know, like, it's like, I was in that, I, I play that organ stuff, like Lee, Lee stuff, and I think when I played with Lee, I wasn't really playing far out enough, really, or, or, you know, enough in that vibe that, that they were going for in terms of oh. uh, the real linear thing. I, mean, I tried on that, and I, I remember, you know, enjoying trying to comp for Lee and Mark and everything. Oh, it was beautiful. Yeah, the comp but is... it was early on in my, I wasn't really, fig hadn't figured out comping yet. No, yeah. come on. A little, I mean, <laughs> I, it's it's yeah. better now, but it was okay. <laughs> it was fun. I had a good time playing with those guys and, and uh, it was nice. And then I remember like four or five years ago, I got a call from Lee and he was like, you know, I've been listening to a lot of my old CDs. And oh, wow. uh, I came across the one we did with Mark, and it's really good. I never listened to it when it came out. You know, I, I don't blame him. I do this. I, I'm the same way. Yeah. But uh, he had heard, listened to it again. He's like, yeah, you really sounded nice on that. I was like, I felt so, like, That's really happy cool. that, that Lee kind of went back and checked it out and was like, yeah, you know, like kind of almost to say, like, I didn't notice it at the time, but you, you played all right on that record. You know, like, <laughs> I felt, uh, you know. That's so I beautiful. Felt, I felt nice. Yeah, no, Lee was great. God, what a what a personality, man. What an individual. Yeah, you you yeah. played you played with so many greats, man. Already, I mean, I've with been the so organ, lucky, man. Organ players like Melvin Ryan. You know, if you played with yeah. Wes, and then I know I've had this you know, connection like, to all my heroes. You know, yeah, all, like, yeah. Not directly, but one step removed. You know, Melvin told me a lot about Wes, and 
and Lou Donaldson told me a lot about oh, Grant Green, Green, Green and, yeah. and people like that. Yeah. And just like, you know, I've just been super lucky to, you know, get yeah. the That's amazing, man. connection to those, to those people. Yeah. My heroes, but yeah, but, uh, yeah, Melvin and Dr. Lonnie taught me a lot. Really playing with Lou and Dr. Lonnie was really amazing. And then getting to play with Dr. Lonnie, make some records with him, like yeah. and be in his trio. He, you know, he was much different when he, when he played Lou's gig, he did his thing, but in the perfect contents of Lou Donaldson's gig. You know, yeah. Lou's super strong himself, so Lou, we all got there behind Lou. But when Lonnie was leading the group, it, it went in a lot of different, you know, yeah, it's more freer, directions. Right? Yeah, and he, he would just do cra all this kind of crazy stuff, and that was a great experience. You know, I was just starting to really figure out how to how to play with Lonnie too. And, but he wanted to go in a more funk, more funky direction, and he needed he needed a guitar. I remember once he had me over to his place. He's like, "You got any pedals, man?" I'm like, "Well, <laughs> I got this." Yeah, yeah, because he wanted he wanted some some you know some freaky sounds, and he wanted to get more into a deeper funk thing. So he's like, "I had this one green box, you know, <laughs> you know, and I had like a wah wah pedal." So I brought it over to his place, and we tried to play some things, and he was cool. But <laughs> at the end, like I felt like, well, you know, he's probably just like gonna gotta you know yeah. he wants to go funky and and he wants somebody who really knows how to use the pedals and really yeah. knows how to get it. i'm still you know i was still trying to just get my sound and i always felt like when i put pedals with this guitar it didn't something affected the way the set the sound came out and affected my phrasing i didn't yeah you know i, I didn't see myself adapting to phrasing with that kind of enhancement on the sound so but i'm yeah. like you know i like i kind of just like pushed it pushed it to the to the super back burner of like i'll try to get with that one day you know when i can develop music that's around those sounds when i'm yeah, playing makes sense you, yeah. you know but i don't know i i don't advocate that i don't advocate like don't use any pedals man it's like use whatever you want the guitar yeah, no, what the guitar want. the amp is something we need to i don't want to stop it you know i just don't think it's really fair that like guitar players who don't use pedals are looked in a certain way that people who play the piano aren't looked at. It's like oh, someone, yeah. you, you yeah. never come up to a piano player on who's playing trio with acoustic bass and drums and say, hey, you play the piano pretty good, but how come you're not playing the synthesizer? Yeah. Like, well, where's, yeah. The, where's the Rhodes? You know, yeah. piano players don't have to answer for that because that instrument somehow is respected. You know, it's a different the guitar yeah. is like, well, you're just playing a plain guitar. You must be like, like I might as well be playing, you know, Gregorian <laughs> chants or some kind of old <laughs> music. Yeah. You know, I was like, wait, but I'm trying to play this instrument. And if yeah. I don't want to use the pedals, it's the content of what I'm playing that's going to make it old or not old. You can't, you know, yeah. I kind of felt that vibe. Like, I mean, it's also part of the guitar thing is there's so much gear. Yeah. Pedals have yeah. just been like, oh, we can do stuff with our feet too. That's just yeah. another whole, you know, area of the body we can like focus on doing stuff and manipulating the sound with I mean, that's why I, that's why i really respect piano players because they have to deal with the music and they have to play the piano they're given mm -hmm. and if the piano is wrong there's no buttons they can there's nothing they can switch to make it better they have to deal with that whereas we have an amp and we yeah. just even if you just have bass and treble and reverb you're going to be turning those buttons all i, I will i'll turn yeah. those buttons all night to try to get the right blend and just like shit, how could I? But a piano player couldn't. It has yeah. to come from from here. And so I just respect the purity of that in terms of the piano. Yeah. But I always thought it was just like a little bit of a, a double standard. Like you can play the p acoustic piano, I and agree. people yeah. say that's cool. But if you play the guitar without effects, that's the first question. You know, how come you don't play with any effects? You know, it's like, yeah, I don't. I mean, I don't know because other people do really yeah. well. <laughs> that's, yeah. that's not what I'm. You know. Yeah. My dog is looking at me. One second here. Sure.